Today is the day we count every single tropical and exotic style plant that's growing in the Grow Paradise Garden. Now this garden is tiny and I've managed to cram in loads of jungly style plants and we've had the perfect combination of weather to make all of these plants grow enormous this year. It's been warm and we've had loads of rain. So I'm gonna set a counter and I'm gonna put every single plant name on screen. So if you're looking for ideas or inspiration for your tro tropical style garden, grab a pen and paper and take note. But don't worry if not, I will put them all in the description of this video. So we'll start on this side, which is the border I call the big jungly border. It's a mix of herbaceous leafy plants and evergreen, big leafy plants for winter structure, like this Areopetria japonica, which is a tree that actually produces edible fruit, which is an orange loquat fruit, and apparently you can make a tea from the young new leaves as well. But I love this tree for its enormous corrugated leaves and evergreen winter structure. Now hanging off the branches of that is this rootless epiphyte air plant. This is Talansia eusenioides. Now this is native, I think, to South America. You'll often find it hanging off of ancient oak trees and just swaying in the breeze. And because it hasn't roots, hasn't got roots, sorry, it uptakes its water from the tiny hairs that cover these leaves. Next to that is another evergreen shrub. This is one of my favorite fatsias. It's Fatsia polycarpa, and this is a cultivar called Green Fingers on account of these really deeply lobed leaves. Again, as an evergreen plant, this will give you that exotic look all through the year. And we'll go down one more level. We've got down here a pair of Dryopteris ferns. I'm unsure of the species of this one. It's semi-evergreen for me, so it provides a bit of foliage, ground cover. And just next to that is Persicaria ronconata purple fantasy. Now this Persicaria has an amazing purple chevron in the leaf. It makes it a fantastic foliage plant for full sun and semi-shade, but it can be a bit of a thug, and you can see that it's starting to flop here. So I chop mine back two or three times a year, and it doesn't look great when you've first done it, but it forces the plant to quickly recover and it puts out much more sturdy short stems and lots more of this foliage. Now that's growing through quite a rare plant. This is Muschia wollastonii and this is the yellow flowering form. Now I grew this from seed um, and I've recently sold quite a few in the shop. This is native to Madeira and it is quite tender. It needs a mild spot in the UK but it has been known to survive um, in warm coastal spots and in city gardens. It has this beautiful serrate edge, lance-shaped foliage, a bit similar to echiums, and then it explodes in a bloom of yellow, almost orchid-like flowers. Now I've got that tucked under that evergreen tree, the loquat tree, just to help try and keep it in a frost-free microclimate, but we'll have to wait till winter to know in, uh, whether that's worked. Now this lush green leaf belongs to an Empatians, Empatians flanaganii, and it spends, for me, a lot of time growing on these thick red stems and not a lot of time at all flowering. So I think this might be the last year this one is growing in the Grow Paradise Garden. And just at the base, down here, is Asarum europaeus, which is called the uh, wild European ginger um, I'm unsure why it's got that name, because it's not a ginger, but it's a really fantastic evergreen ground cover plant. So when all of the big herbaceous stuff has died back, this is going to hold the fort. I'll come up to here. These enormous leaves belong to a hydrangea. Now, I wanted to feature this plant on the channel more this year, but the snails and slugs have absolutely wiped it out. It's hydrangea aspera, and it has enormous, thick, furry leaves, and this is a cultivar called Sargentiana, with blue flowers, and it will grow in full sun, unlike most hydrangeas. So I'm gonna see if I can get this one into rehab, and when it's looking much better, we'll plant it out into the garden. What else have we got? Schefflera Taiwaniana, again, another plant that's seen better days. With the amount of rain that we've had, the slugs and snails have really mobilized this year, and they are just chomping through the leaves but I grow organically, so I don't use any pesticides or anything. So if there's no holes in the leaves in your garden, then you're not sharing it with the wildlife. So I don't mind too much. As long as it recovers, 
we're good. Again, that leaf next to it belongs to Roldana cristobalensis. As this kind of frog foot shaped leaf, they get enormous. You can see it's bigger than my hand there. And this cristobalensis form has a velvety purple underside. Now this is half hardy, probably to about USDA gardening zone nine. Um, it hasn't survived outside for me, so I take cuttings every year and it's relatively easy to propagate that way to keep backup plants in a cold winter. Just in front of that, the plant everybody wants, Brassiopsis mitis, with this amazing snowflake leaf. Now this one is planted out into the ground. It's the first year in the ground for me. And they are said to be pretty hardy in the UK, so I'm hoping it gets by. But once you set them free, once you put them into the ground, they grow like mad. This has already doubled in size this year, and I'm just getting more and more of these amazing leaf shapes. There's nothing else in the garden that grows like this, especially not hardy plants. I've got the must-have, Musa Basdu banana, which is towering up and over the garden. Now it's got shredded this year because we've had so many winds and my garden's relatively coastal. But as I've mentioned before, the leaves on the bananas have evolved to shred, to let the wind blow through and that central leaf vein stays intact so that this can still continue photosynthesizing and feeding the plant so that it can push out fresh new leaves from the middle of the banana's stem, which is a really good trick. Now, up almost at the height of the banana is another Impatiens. This is Impatiens tinctoria from South Africa. This is one of my favorite. They call it the giant busy lizzie because well, I'm six foot and this is at head height and I can see a few stems at the back there that are reaching on for seven or eight feet. This will have white flowers that are really sweetly scented at night with a red speckled throat. And it's just a really good, fast growing, evergreen, uh, not evergreen, hardy, sorry, herbaceous plant. It will die back to underground tubers, but quickly regrows to this height when the weather's right in spring. What else have we got? Uh -huh. These dinner plate sized leaves belong to Bohemeria platyphylla and the name alludes to plate sized leaves, plate shaped leaves. This is a really nice foliage plant. Again, I grew this with a bit of protection from seed. I have now planted it out and it's flowering. You can see down there. So hopefully I'll get lots more seed to grow some more for the nursery. But this is said to be hardy. It should survive for me. I'm about USDA gardening zone nine. So it'll be interesting to see if this is a plant that can be cultivated a lot more in the UK. Now, this leaf next to it is a fuchsia, a very fast growing and large growing fuchsia from the cloud forests of Colombia. This one I grew from seed and you can see how it flowers. It's got these amazing tubular flowers. Now the seed packet said it was gonna be the red form. So this whole tube should be red, but I don't mind. This is still an impressive flower for a UK garden and you can see the sheer flower power it's got. And these are seed pods developing from flowers that have been pollinated by native insects. So it's doing its bit for the local wildlife as well, which is a good balance to have. Then down here, my Colocasia pink china has gone mad this year. You can see them growing all up and over that Corton steel water bowl, which is a bit murky in the undergrowth now. But these leaves have grown the biggest I've ever seen on this Colocasia. And Colocasia pink china is one of the hardiest Colocasias you can grow. It's like any other herbaceous perennial. It will die back to below ground level and then regrow in spring. And once it's happy, you can see how prolific it is. It's sending out runners everywhere. So I've got a sea of pink china emerging. Um, I'll probably lift the younger ones and pot them on for winter, but I'll let the big established corms just die back and they'll regrow in spring. Now another Colocasia I've got, which is the first time in the Grow Paradise Garden, is this really nice foliage, foliage plant. It's Colocasia mojito, with this mottled leaf markings. Really, really nice. Now, this is growing, it was in full sun, but as the garden's grown, it's in pretty much full to partial shade. And it's thriving. It's quite a delicate leaf, so it needs that protection from wind. So being tucked in down here has served it really, really well. And I've seen people say that these are quite slow growers, but I'd say plant it out somewhere with moist soil and Colocasia mojito grows really well as a summer plant outdoors in the UK. Now, just behind that, 
right at the bottom here is a plant that I forgot about. I found an empty pot in winter and tipped it out into the garden just to reuse the compost and then this is regrown. This is a begonia, a hardy begonia, and it's a hybrid, begonia um, torsa. And this is a hybrid between begonia grandis and begonia fusca. So it has all of the hardiness of begonia grandis, but it will get the leaf size of begonia fusca. So this is quite small at the moment because it's not in the best spot. Like I say, I thought the pot was empty and I tipped it out and then this has grown. So I will lift this come autumn and get it back to health in a pot again. We've also got a fern under here. This is Dryopteris, um, an evergreen fern in the UK, and it's called Cristata the King, because it can grow pretty big, and it's got these cristated leaf forms, and it splits at the end of each part of the leaflet, like a snake tongue, and it does that all the way along the leaves and at the end, so it's something a bit different if you're into your ferns. Now, at the back here, behind the sea of Colocasia pink china, is a nice evergreen grass, Ophiopogon japonicus, and it's often called Mondo grass. I've planted this here so that when the uh, Colocasia pink china dies back, this evergreen grass is gonna form a nice mat, so there's still something to look at even in the depths of winter. While we're down at this level, let's have a look. Look at the state of this. It's okay, because everything's so lush, you can't see this from the top. This is Ceteria palmifolia. It's a tropical grass and it has these amazing leaves that look like um, palm leaf seedlings, but it's not, it's a grass and it grows quite tall. You can see this one is up to about, I don't know, 45, maybe 60 centimeters. And it's got really nice corrugated leaves. And in many parts of the UK, this has proved reasonably hardy. It will die back in winter and then regrow again in the heat of spring. So this one's planted out and Time will tell. Subscribe if you're not already and we'll see if it regrows next spring. Now, there's a banana stem behind there that we can have a look at. This is Musa sycamensis. And it's not the red tiger form. This is just standard Musa sycamensis that I grew from seed last spring. So this is probably about 18 months old now from seed. This is by far my favorite banana for a UK garden. It's kind of second hardiest to Musa Basdu. It's very fast growing and it has these really nice coppery leaf undersides and kind of the characteristic red tiger stripes on the leaves. And like I say, from seed, this one is maybe 10, 12 foot in 18 months. So once you get them going, they are very, very fast growing. Next to that is a hardy salvia. One you don't see growing often in UK gardens. This was introduced into cultivation in the UK by the team at Krug Plants. And I think it's one of my favorite salvias. It's got these huge vine-like leaves that are really furry and tactile. And it does get sky blue flowers. You can see some just emerging there. I'll do another video later on showing the flowers in full bloom. This will die back to ground level and then regrow quickly. The same as all the other exotic plants in the warmth of spring and it's got huge underground tubers and it survived a minus five for me last winter. So this is a great plant. We've got Musa cheese manii here. Again, seed grown, um, about the same age as the Musa sycamensis, about 18 months. And it's got these kind of pale gray, blue leaf midribs, narrow green leaves and this dusty blue stem. Something a little bit different if you're into the banana plants. This dark leaf is Canna tropicana black. Now, this was in full sun, but as I say, as the garden's grown and the canopy's filled in, this has disappeared into the shade, so it's not really been a grower this year. But that dark foliage is still a really nice contrast against all the greenery in the rest of the garden. And this plant, which I don't think I've actually featured on the channel before, is or has the potential to be an enormous evergreen tree. It's Podocarpus henkelii, and this one's growing in a pot. It's just developing its stem, but look at these really nice leaves. It's got these long, weeping, narrow evergreen leaves. So when I've got all of the other evergreen plants in the garden with those big, broad leaves, this is gonna contrast nicely and really help to provide year-round contrast and interest. Now behind there is a selection of 
tillandsia, which is more air plants, and you can see that some of them have flowered or are flowering. And these have been outside since about March or April. Um, there's one here, Tillandsia bergii hybrid, that flowered outside. This one's said to be reasonably hardy in the UK. It will take zero degrees for short periods of time. Um, so you can mount this against walls or into the branches of larger shrubs and trees. We've then got the red sugar cane. Now there is a debate ongoing as to whether this is actually just a giant penicetum, which is a, another type of grass, but it's more common sold as a red sugar cane with this kind of maroon pink stripe going down the middle of the leaf, these really nice hairy purple canes, and this grows rapidly. So this one's still in a pot so that I can protect it in winter, and I'm gonna use it as a stock plant for propagation. And then at the foot of that is a massive Aeonium cyclops. These giant succulents are very, very fast growing and they actually grow best in moist soil in partial shade. So this is why this plant, which was a cutting in spring, has done so well here under the cover of all of the bigger plants in the rest of the garden. And at the foot of Aeonium cyclops, we've got this one. This is Aeonium Cornish Rose. This is an Aeonium that self-seeded onto the cliffs in Cornwall. And because of the mild microclimate, down in the south of the UK, they have survived really, really well. So I got this one to see how well it would cope with the cold in my garden, and I left one out and kept some warm in the greenhouse. And as I said, we experienced minus five degrees Celsius this winter, so I lost the plant that was left out. So they obviously don't take that much cold, but this is cuttings from the one that I kept in the greenhouse. And it's a really nice branching form, so you get lots of little rosettes, unlike Aeonium cyclops, which lives up to its name with this one big green eye. Um, these will actually tinge more purple as it gets more sunlight. And then let's have a look around. These enormous leaves belong to Woodwardia radicans, the giant European chain fern. This completely died back to the knuckle because of that cold winter we had. And then look at the size it's grown to already. It's a really, really good plant for underplanting larger shrubs in your garden. Um, it just gives you evergreen in mild winters or semi-evergreen foliage. And it's one of these plants that keeps giving because it reproduces from little bulbils at the tips of the leaves. So you can see I've harvested one here. Now the shrub I've got that one planted under is Euphorbia mellifera. Now this is a hybrid of Stigiana and Euphorbia mellifera. So it's Euphorbia cross pasteurii. And it's much hardier for me than the regular Euphorbia mellifera. And because it's a hybrid, it is packed with hybrid vigor. I put this in as maybe a four foot wide plant and it's already, I'd say about six foot wide and it's taking up far too much room in my garden. So I think I'm gonna chop this up for cuttings and maybe swap it out for something else. We'll see. Now, plants that are in the same family as the Tillandsia air plants I've shown you are these bromeliads. Now this is a selection of Nea regelia. And this purple one is Nea Regelia Hansen Mini. And they collect rainwater in that central rosette. And then we've got Nea Regelia Punctatissima, wide leaf form. These here, which look really good as the kind of evening sun shines through that leaf color. And I think by growing epiphytes in the trees in your garden, it's just really helping elevate it to that tropical rainforest look. And another here, Nea Regelia Thera, which is a bit like Punctatissima, but with a slightly co more coppery leaf. Now the tree I've got them growing in is Rus Typhina. And I've been reading about the flowers, the berries in the flowers are a spice that you can dry and use in cooking, um, but you can also use it to make a slightly peppery lemonade. So I think we're gonna give that a go uh, before the berries go over. We've got another bromeliad here. This one is Nea regelia antigone. And you can see that once they're happy collecting rainwater, because they don't have roots, so they collect the rainwater um, in this central rosette, they produce pups and they'll offset and multiply. So each one of these is gonna be a clone of the parent plant. So if you find a color that you like and they start producing pups, they're gonna be exact clones of that one that you like. So you can chop them off and just wrap some moss around the roots and you'll start a whole new colony of plants. 
We've actually got more bromeliads growing as terrestrial plants. That's plants in compost or soil or a mix of orchid bark because they like it quite free draining. So we've got a Bilbergia hybrid here, which is kind of a, a wide leaved purple form with this silver banding on the leaf. And this one is producing so many offsets. We've got Bilbergia aliulia and another there that I can't remember the name of, but I'll put it on screen. And then we go to the narrow shady border. Now this border has been a real struggle for me in previous years, but I feel like this year we're starting to get it right. The challenge is because it flanks the garden path and we've got the enormous euphorbia on that side, we need to find plants that fill out this space, which is about maybe 45 to 50 centimeters from fence to the front, um, but without spilling too much over into the path because we need enough space to walk down to the back of the house into the car park. So we started with evergreen shrubs like this Griselenia littoralis, which is a really tough evergreen shrub. And littoralis means that it survives in salty weather conditions. So this is sort of a sacrificial plant. You can see there's some leaf scorch there. This will take the brunt of the worst of windy and cold weather, and it will protect all of the other exotics in the garden. This is planted for the same reason. Lunus, no, Prunus laurocerus, or something like that, the cherry laurel. Really nice big evergreen leaves, so it provides that structure in winter. And we've got the berries, which is food for the local wildlife. Um, go along one more. I've got this lovely Sambucus nigra. This is one called blue sheen because the leaves, when the sunlight catches them right, have like a metallic blue sheen under that dark purple color. And you can see covered in berries again, really, really good for the passing local birds. And I like to find kind of a tropical style garden that will support local wildlife as well. And then our golden Indian bean tree, Catulpa bignonioides, has done really, really well this year with these huge heart-shaped golden green leaves. It hasn't flowered this year, it did last year. It has kind of white foxglove type flowers, but the foliage looks great nonetheless. Underneath that, we've got an evergreen shrub. Fatsia japonica, and this is the variegated form, with kind of these creamy white variegated marks on the leaves. This one was a rescue plant from a garden center four or five years ago, with a couple of leaves and a bent stem, and we put it in the ground, and it's done really, really well. So let's work from one end to the other and see what we've got growing in this border. Down here is Saxifraga stolonifera. This is a plant more commonly sold as a house plant, um, sometimes called the strawberry begonia, and it's got a lovely red underside, this kind of veined textured leaf, and they're quite thick and waxy, so it remains evergreen even in the coldest of winters. For me, it's taken minus five, stayed evergreen, and then flowered in spring, so it's a great plant. Empatians, uh, omiana, and this is a cultivar called pink nerves, or pink veins, because it's lovely pink coloration. Now this will colonize an area, but it's competing with the Saxifraga here. So I've only got a couple of shoots and you can see the slugs have been eating this as well. Now this really cool, enormous leaf belongs to Brunnera Alexander's Great. Now because this leaf is covered in tiny little hairs, the slugs seem to be leaving it alone. And this really bright silvery color looks great in the shady spot here, it just brightens it up. I've got another bromeliad growing uh, with its roots just wrapped in moss. This is Achmia, a larger growing species, uh, Achmia blanchettiana, and this is orange form. So it's slightly reverting back to kind of a pale green, but you can see the more sunlight it gets, the more bright orange the leaves are going to turn. And when it flowers, it'll produce an enormous orange flower spike too. Just next to that is an Amorpha phallus and the name literally means penis shaped. It's got this mottled stem, like a burgundy mottled stem with white spots and really nice purpley green leaves with this magenta leaf edge and this textured underside. Now this is Amorphophallus atraviridis. It's a really nice plant, but it is tender. So I'm gonna to have to bring it inside in the winter months where it will go dormant, but I'll keep it in its pot and it should regrow in spring. We've got some more bromeliads 
growing on the branches of the laurel. So we've got Neorigelia iris, which I think is one of my favorites. Neorigelia, let's find the label on this one. Super fireball. And you can see actually they're collecting leaf debris and old flowers as well. So this is how they'll collect food in the wild. When they're growing on the tops of trees, they can't get their roots down to collect nutrients. So everything that falls in to that central rosette is gonna act as hydration and food. They're really resilient and well-adapted plants. Another one here, which is catching the light, just shining over the fence. This is Neorigelia rubra, with faint banding on the leaves there. And there's one more. This is Neorigelia Forster's favorite, and this flowered earlier in the year. So there are seed pods developing. So I'm hoping I can have a go at growing some more of this one from seed. The fern we've got at the back is Polystichum munitum, which is an evergreen fern. I think they call it the sword fern. And this has got really nice, rugged, thick leaves. And it's, this has stayed evergreen for me in winter. Maybe a couple of leaves will brown off, but for the most part, it's evergreen. And it combines really well with these hardy begonias. Now this one is Begonia grandis. Um, I think Alba because of the white flowers. And this is lovely because it's got this red veined, red underside to the leaf and it grows. This is about 45 centimeters tall on these fleshy stems. These hardy begonias, I think are really underrated. More people should be using them. They survive, I'm in heavy clay soil and these have survived winter with all the rain we get and grown back prolifically in spring and summer. And there's actually another one back here while we're talking hardy begonias. This is Begonia pedata feeda. And what a great plant for a shady spot, completely hardy. These lush green leaves held on bright red stems. And it dies back to an underground rhizome in winter. And you also get the bonus of these pale pink to white flowers. And then this shark fin shaped seed pod, which is very cool. And another hardy begonia down here, Begonia sutherlandii. And this is a, a new cultivar for me. This is one called papaya because of the color of these orange flowers. And this has been flowering all summer long and it produces tiny little bulb wheels on the leaves and it will drop those around and it will colonize an area. So I'm hoping to see this come back next year. Now this evergreen plant that I use to flank the entirety of the narrow border is a chorus gramineus and a cultivar called Ogon. It's fantastic because it's they've got this bright yellow variegation. It really helps just to brighten up what would otherwise be a very dark shady border. And another hardy fern down here. This is Adiantum venustum. So it's a hardy maiden's hair fern. You'll often see this, or a cousin of this one, sold as a house plant. And this should come back year on year and colonize this little area. I love the way these small delicate leaves contrast against bigger leaves like that of the begonia. What else have we got? Another Impatiens there, Impatiens omiana, and this one is called white lightning because instead of the pink nerves, it's got these white streaks going through the leaf. And then there's just two plants that I forgot in this first take. This is the first one, Vasconella pubescens, or the mountain papaya, and this has grown into a beast for me this year. The stem is covered in flowers, but unfortunately, none of it is forming into fruit. I don't know if perhaps you need a male and a female plant for these. And behind that is my Pseudopanax laetus, which is an evergreen shrub from New Zealand in the same family as Schefflora, and I love it. So there we go. We've managed to cram in over 62 plants in a tiny tropical style garden in the UK. Now remember, this is only the plants that are actually growing in the Grow Paradise garden. We run a nursery and an online seed club alongside this outside in the same space. So if I looked into the greenhouse, we could probably get this number up to 100, but my mouth was getting dry and I need a drink of water. Now, hopefully this video has given you some ideas for new plants to add to your garden, and I'd love to hear your feedback. Don't forget, we've created an online forum, which is a free community for people that love growing tropical and exotic plants and just love gardening in general. You can create posts, share pictures and ask questions there. And if you're interested in growing any plants like this, feel free to check out our online shop and perhaps sign up to the Seed Club, which is our monthly subscription box. Thank you so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one.